All right. Uh, next, I have the pleasure of introducing Daniel Braun, who will be presenting on risk ambiguity and human motor control. While Daniel's talk today will be focused on risk-related topics, it's worth mentioning that these reflect only a small subset of Daniel's diverse expertise and research interests. Daniel has degrees in physics, biology, philosophy, as well as doctorates in computational neuroscience and philosophy of the mind from Freiburg University. In 2011, he has established an independent research group on sensory motor learning and decision-making. And in 2015, he received an ERC standing grant on bounded rationality and sensor motor coordination. <clears throat> Since 2016, he has been a professor of learning systems at Ulm University. Daniel's uh, diverse publication history includes more than a decade of thoughtful work on risk, ambiguity, and bounded rationality. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Brown. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Hi, I'm Daniel, uh, joining uh, from Ulm. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm sorry I can't be there today. So I'm going to talk about um, how we use risk sensitive uh, models to understand better um, human motor control. So when we uh, open an AI or cognitive science book, we typically find intelligent behavior formalized as the problem of optimal decision making. And very abstractly, we can think about the decision making problem as uh, choosing between um, different lotteries where you could imagine a lottery as a, um, a roulette wheel that has different outcomes and each outcome has a different probability and a different desirability or utility for the decision maker. And now we can think of motor control as also such a decision-making process where we choose a sequence of control commands that determine a distribution over movement trajectories that have different utilities, for example, different movement efforts, task accuracy, trajectory smoothness, and so on. Um, and then we also have uh, uncertainty attached to these trajectories. But unlike the uncertainty um, in roulettes, in casinos, this motor uncertainty can arise both extrinsically, like for example, if we followed a randomly moving target, as well as intrinsically from our own body, for example, through motor execution noise, like when we throw a dart arrow, or like here, Wilhelm Tell trying to shoot um, an apple. Now, abstractly, the decision problem as the solution of finding the lottery with the highest expected um, utility that requires us to have probability models such that we can compute this expectation. And we also need the computational resources to compute and uh, differentiate these expected utilities. Now, here's an example of a pioneering study from Julia Trommershäuser that uh, shows how motor control can be cast as a decision-making process. And in that study, subjects are required to do fast pointing movements on, on a screen to these little value circles. And depending on where the end point of the movement was, um, you get, for example, $1 or uh, minus 10 or minus nine and so on. And because the movements had to be so fast, um, subjects ended up producing a distribution over endpoints and we can such that we can define the mean of this distribution as an aim point. And then they could ask the question whether subjects would choose their aim points in a statistically optimal fashion um, such that it would maximize the expected return. And indeed, as you can see here in this graph that shows the uh, predicted versus the actual um, end point, aim points um, that they found that subjects um, naturally optimize this, uh, this expected value. Here's another example uh, using optimal control models to better understand uh, human motor behavior. This is from a while ago. Um, I was part of this project where we um, modeled the control of complex mass spring damper objects that could move in weird directions and so on. And we used an optimal controller that minimized control effort and endpoint um, accuracy. As you can see here in this example plot, um, you see here two different kinds of models and the actual uh, subject data. And you see that with this model, you're able to reproduce uh, subjects' movements are only for this object, but also for different kinds of objects that are not displayed here, you can find in the paper. 
Now, the, uh, the central concept of all these uh, different models is the concept of rationality from economics that posits that a rational decision maker should at all times um, choose an action that maximizes expected performance given um, the current beliefs, right? So we have to have these um, probability models to do that. Now, in economics, there have also been other ideas of how to choose between different lotteries. And one of these ideas is the idea of uh, risk sensitive decision makers that don't only care about the mean payoff, but also care about payoff variability. And one prime example of this approach is Markowitz risk return model that is used for modern uh, portfolio theory. It basically trades off two terms. One here is the expected utility and the other one is the risk of the utility. It's just the variability measure. And then we have this um, a risk parameter that reproduces uh, the, uh, if it's zero, reproduces the uh, expected return model. And otherwise it adds or subtracts value from a lottery depending on whether you're risk seeking or risk averse with the idea that a risk seeking um, 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 decision maker will basically find a, a lottery more attractive so, um, because they pose, um, they hope that they will get an even unlikely but very high utility, whereas the risk averse decision maker basically thinks that um, an unlikely event is going to be very bad and that it's going to subtract value. Another widespread class of um, economic models, uh, risk sensitive are so-called multiplier preferences, a special case of the variational preferences. You can um, express them like this and they're variational because you have this maximum operation here. And you also start with a, um, a probability model, but then this probability model can be distorted and now depends whether there's a maximization or a minimization at this point here, whether you're risk uh, seeking or risk averse, because then you, you look to give a lottery basically a higher value than the expected utility or a lower value than the expected utility. And if you actually solve this maximization um, with this uh, constraint with the kuhlberg library divergence, you get exactly this kind of exponential um, cost function that was mentioned already. Um, that uh, basically you can think of as a cumulant generating function. That means it generates all the higher order moments of, um, of the payoff, which under some conditions give you then uh, also a mean variance trade off in a Taylor series approximation. So we were looking into finding evidence for this kind of um, deviation from expected utility decision-making in human motor control. This was here, one of our um, first studies where we asked, is there any kind of evidence for deviation from this kind of risk neutrality? And what we did is we had um, subjects move um, a manipulandum. They had to hit this target line. Um, and once they hit this target line with a certain velocity, then there was a simulation that showed a ball moving forward and it moved further, the harder this line was hit at the location where it was hit. And as you see here in color code, um, the high reward regions are here in the end. So that means you want to hit hard right in the middle, right? And then this falls off, but you have to be quite precise. If you, uh, in the beginning, you get basically less reward, but it's also less chance of, um, of, uh, of a cost, so to say. Now, the tricky bit here is that there is a speed accuracy trade-off, right? So the harder you hit, um, the higher the, the variance in your position. Um, and, and that's what makes this task um, difficult for humans. Now, we used two different um, reward functions, one that basically fell off uh, linearly and one that fell off quadratically. And then we paired these um, reward functions with uh, a reward function that we obtained simply by a linear affine transformation. And we did that because utility functions are uh, invariant under linear affine transformations. That means the optimal answer is, uh, doesn't change. And so we have here basically the same expected utility, which we make sure by adjusting this, this offset here for each subject to fit the same 
a level of the utility um, and the optimal response stays the same. Um, so the prediction now is that if you only care about the mean payoff, um, then going in between these pairs should not change the optimal velocity with which you choose to, to, to do this task. However, if you care about variability, then that would change. And so here you see that illustrated the mean reward um, for the two um, variance conditions for the linear cost function, this word one subject, and you see that the optimal response is the same. And because we have this offset, we adjusted also the, the absolute value here is the same, but then um, the mean reward falls off um, differently depending on the high and low variance condition. So here you see um, the results of the subjects we tested. Um, so you always have to compare high and low variance condition for the linear and the quadratic uh, case. Um, and here we look at the mean velocity that subjects chose to perform the task. And what you see is that for more than half the subjects, we see a consistent change in both velocities, right? Um, so that means that subjects are either, either risk averse or risk seeking, right? they, they change, they, they take the variance into account. And then we have here in the middle subjects that changed uh, maybe only one uh, or none, or here we have one that changed um, inconsistently, one case uh, averse and the other case seeking. But if we put them all in one graph and see, okay, how did they change the velocity in the linear task compared to the uh, quadratic task, you see that actually, except this one subject, we see a consistent change where subjects were either uh, behaving if they were risk seeking um, or risk averse. In a follow up study, we asked them whether we can understand um, this risk sensitivity also as a mean variance trade-off. And for that, we designed um, another control task where we had two steps. Um, in the first step, subject had to decide whether to try and hit this uh, bar on the left. So that was a certain hit always, um, or to try and hit this target here on the right. And that target could be changed in size and was adjusted to subject skill level. And there was always a probability to miss that target. And now in the second phase of the trial, then subjects had to move to one of these effort circles. And for the certain response, it was always the same effort circle at the same location. And that was basically a force pushing against you. And you had to uh, basically exercise a force that was more annoying the higher this effort circle was, right? And so in the um, risky condition, you had two effort circles, one where you hit the target. So that was below the certain one that was nicer. And then we had one that was higher up that was more nasty. And now by basically adjusting the size of this target, that means the hitting probability and the location of these two effort circles, we could then basically um, describe such a, a trial by a mean effort and a variance in the effort. Right, And now what we could do is we could um, basically make a prediction for how subjects should value the risky choice if they were uh, evaluating it with a mean variance trade-off. Um, and then we compare that to the safe bet, right? That was always the same with the same effort um, on the other side. And now what we do is we look for indifference points between the two where subjects would be 50-50, they don't care whether they choose one or the other. And for these indifferent points, these, uh, this equation would have to hold, right? Because these two utilities would have to be the same. Um, and what we then did is by varying the target size and um, the location of these effort circles, we could create five classes um, that had all more or less the same variance. So we had five different variance levels. Um, and then we could look at what is basically the, the, the lotteries that subject would choose, what kind of expectation value would they have, right, such that they would be indifferent between these two things. And it's clear that if you're risk neutral, 
then you should accept exactly lotteries where the expectation value would be 10, just like in the short case, like 10 is now an arbitrary um, value of the effort. However, if you're risk seeking, then subjects would accept also lotteries that have a higher mean effort, larger than 10, which means basically they hope they would be lucky, right? And get a, a fa the favorable target because one of the targets is always better than the other one of one of these effort circles, I mean. Um, whereas a risk averse subject would only accept lotteries that has less effort, right? Um, so now here you see um, what we got from our experiment. You see on the X axis, the five different uh, variance levels. And you see on the Y axis, the mean effort that subjects uh, would basically were prepared to spend to be indifferent to the sure bet, right? And you see that actually most subjects in this case, they were risk seeking, right? They are happy to accept um, more effort. And we have uh, a couple of neutral ones and then a couple, a few uh, um, risk seeking ones and uh, risk averse ones. And then you see um, that the line in most of the cases provides a reasonable fit to that modulation, right? So this, I mean, variance trade off sort of. Um, it's a reasonable description of that behavior. Now I mentioned in the introduction that also optimal control models are quite common to a model human motor behavior. And so the natural question would be whether we could also understand uh, or find effects of risk sensitive optimal feedback control like it was um, developed by Whittle. Um, and for that, we designed a task where um, subjects had to control the cursor in the uh, horizontal um, direction here. Um, and the cursor would go with constant velocity towards this target bar here. And if it hit the target bar in the middle, you would have a minimal um, error cost. And the further you move away from this middle, the higher would be this error cost. And on top, you would have a control cost by how much control you exerted on the way that it was a cumulative cost that was added on top. Um, and now we had two conditions where this um, horizontal motion of the particle was perturbed by Brownian motion. And in one of the conditions, the variance of this Brownian motion was larger than the other, right? But the expectation is the same. And so the question here is, if you're um, a risk uh, neutral, this should not make a difference, the two conditions, right? If you're risk seeking, you should basically welcome the increase in variability. And if you're risk averse, you should be horrified by it. And so this is exactly what the optimal controllers predict in this case. So in the risk neutral case, you see here the two noise levels for the process noise, um, state feedback controllers. And we plot here now this gain function. And you see in the two colors, if you're risk neutral, your control gains remain exactly the same. However, if you are risk averse, and risk seeking, then this is not the case. If you're risk averse, then if the variability increases, you will increase your control because you feel you act like the extra noise is like an adversarial that's trying to harm you. Um, in contrast, when you're risk seeking, it's the opposite, then you act like the environment with the extra noise is uh, beneficial to you and acts in your favor, right? And so you reduce your controls actually. Now, what did subjects do? We tested um, two different cost levels where uh, just to produce the same kind, see whether this uh, result holds for different cost levels. Um, and then for each cost level, we had these two variability conditions. And you see here uh, in a single subject where we plotted the control gains and then regressed that. Um, and you see that in the high noise condition, this subject um, increase the control gains also here in, in when a different cost level was chosen. Um, and here you see basically uh, the control gains in the low noise case plotted versus the high noise case. And you see that basically all but one subject were um, clearly behaving um, risk averse, right? They increased their control gains uh, in the presence of increased noise. Now, another interesting aspect of 
this uh, risk sensitive linear quadratic control is um, that you don't see in this previous study is that estimation and control um, become not so clearly separated anymore. So here we didn't have any uh, observation noise. So that's why here nothing happened. Um, but if we include now observation noise and hidden variables, um, then the estimation gets distorted by the control cost, for example. So for that, we basically um, designed an experiment that's inspired by a previous experiment that I'll show you in a minute, where subjects had to move from a start bath uh, to, to a target area and then to a goal bar and back. And in this target area, they would be shown information about the hidden target that could have different degrees of reliability. It could be perfect information. It could be uh, noisy information. So you get some idea about the location of a target or it could be no information. In that case, you would have to rely on your prior knowledge that you've learned over many trials of where the target usually is. And in a, um, um, a previous study, it was shown that under these conditions, humans can optimally combine the prior information um, with uh, the feedback. So if X is the hidden variable, let's say the target location and Y is the sensory observation, um, then depending on the reliability of your feedback, right? You would have sensory feedback, you would have a narrow uh, likelihood in case you know exactly where the target is and quite a broad one if you don't get any good information. And then this information is combined and you see that the less reliable your sensor information is, the closer you go towards the mean of the prior, right, which is here. Now, if you always act according to the maximum of this distribution, then you can plot this behavior um, in terms of these um, error lines. So this diagonal line here um, would basically uh, show how you act um, when you always go to the mean of the prior, right? So if you have no information, the best thing you can do is always go to the mean of the prior, which gives you a zero error exactly in one case, namely when the true location of the target is also the mean of the prior. And otherwise, the further you move away from this mean and the true location, you get a linear increase in the error, right? Now, the other extreme is that you always have perfect feedback about the location. And in that case, you would have zero error wherever. Right, And then if you have partial information, these lines here are, all, are in between these two extremes. Um, now, if we model this using basically just expected utility maximization compared to the risk sensitive optimization, we put here the posterior distribution over the hidden variable given our observation Y, and we assume here a quadratic cost for missing the target, which is a standard way to model this. And down here, we use the uh, risk sensitive version of this. Then we see that we don't get any difference in the prediction, right? It just says we should move towards uh, where we've seen the target and with a strength that depends on a mixture between, on the weighting between the prior reliability and the reliability of our sensory feedback. However, if we now add a control cost um, here, in both cases that is linear, then the predictions change. So both predict um, a constant offset that is not of much interest, just says how important is it to avoid this extra cost compared to the cost of missing the target. Um, but we get this interesting term here that mixes control cost and estimation. And basically what this term says is that um, if you have a higher uncertainty, right? The sigma i is the sensory feedback uncertainty. If you have higher uncertainty, then you can allow larger deviations from the statistical optimum, right? So this here is the control cost and this here is the risk sensitivity parameter. And now this is something we can test, right? Uh, whether we can see this deviation from the expected utility prediction. And for that, what we did is we had this force area here introduced between the target and the goal. And this force area was, was either with a basically zero force, 
that reproduce the previous experiment or linear increasing or decreasing force. And now here you see what the predictions are then in the top, the model predictions, in the bottom, a typical subject. So what your prediction is that if you have basically low uncertainty, it means high reliability of sensory information, you have no error, right? You do always perfectly and you do so independent of whether the force field is present or not, right? That's predicted and that's also more or less what we find. And then if the uncertainty increases, um, you find this increase in slope, right? That was previously described. Um, but now what you also see is um, this offset in the presence of the force that increases, right? So here the offset is bigger than here, um, that increases when the uncertainty increases. So you see this interaction between um, uncertainty and, uh, and control cost, right? That's predicted uh, by this kind of cost function. And so this was for one subject, but you can also see that for many. So you have here the three different forces and, th and then for each force, you see the different uh, reliabilities. And you see here basically um, how the slope of this error function, right, um, increases like this that was previously described. And now what's different is that we also have an increase in the, um, in the intercept when uh, such a force is present, like it's predicted by this risk sensitive control scheme. Um, okay, five more minutes, good. Um, so these kind of um, risk sensitive functions or these uh, multiplier preferences, as I mentioned earlier, they, they usually find them in the economics literature in the context of um, what you do when you have basically model misspecification. You want robust decision-making. Right? And you see that illustrated here. You have here a decision-maker that decides between two lotteries with well-defined uh, probabilities. And here you have basically um, one lottery where you don't have probability information, right? And the question is, what do you do now? Um, and the question is, can you, is that different from this? Can you not just assume a prior and it's not the same as on the right? Um, so this is the famous Ellsberg paradox that shows that that's not the case. Uh, basically, here's a simplified version. You have to choose between a risky urn and an ambiguous urn. In the risky urn, you know the composition, 50-50, red and blue balls. In the ambiguous one, you don't. And I give you a $10 price if you choose a red ball, right? And 70% of people typically choose uh, the risky urn, which means if you want to express it with probabilities, that they believe there's less red and blue balls, right, in the ambiguous one. If now I change the question and ask, okay, I give you $10 if you draw a blue ball, still 70% prefer the risky urn. And that means now they believe there's um, less blue balls than red balls, right? So if you put the two things together, you immediately realize that that doesn't quite work out. The question is what's going on, whether people are irrational or whether there's a different decision criteria, right? And one idea is that in such a non-probabilistic case, you could, for example, use uh, a maximum criterion, right, to, de to decide. So you take the best worst case, which would be this one in this case, right, because here the worst case is zero. Um, but this could be just an extreme, right? So if you want a continuum of that, you could still assume, oh, hey, I have a probabilistic model, and now I'm not sure about this model, so I allow model misspecification, allow also models in the neighborhood of this model, and I measure that with this kuhlberg leibler divergence, right, between the probabilities, and I say they have, this has to be smaller than some value kappa. And then I take the same idea. So now I have a family of models. And from these models, I pick the one that is the best or the worst, depending on whether I'm seeking or avoiding um, ambiguity, right? And so you end up exactly with this kind of um, variational preference that we can, that is identical to the exponential risk sensitivity. Um, and with this, you can interpolate then between expected utility and maximum decision making, right, by varying this alpha parameter. Um, so that's what we tried in, in our experiment, um, maybe just briefly, because we're already advanced in time. So we had one earn task where you had to decide between risky and ambiguous earn. And on the ambiguous earn, you were shown a small amount of samples. And the same with the motor task, we had to decide between trying to hit a target that was 
basically adjust it to miss it 50% of the time. So you know that one and one that was uh, basically occluded, so you don't know how big that target is, right? And the payoff was every time a force that you try to avoid. Um, and what we're looking for now is for trials where the expectation is always 50-50, but varies in the amount of information, right? If I don't show you anything about the ambiguous turn, or I show you quite a few samples, right? Then the variance is reduced, but the expectation is always the same. And now if you look at these trials, what you see is that if we now look at the amount of information that was revealed in the two tasks, right, that, um, that this information, uh, as the information increased, so decreased your preference for the risky choice, right? So here we see that subjects prefer the risky choice, just like in the Ellsberg experiment, when you do the earn task, in the motor task, we found it the other way around, they preferred actually the ambiguous choice, interestingly. Right, and this you can model with this kind of um, risk or see, risk sensitive or ambiguity sensitive function, but not with expected utility decision making. Um, right, so you can also use the same idea to understand interactions between agents by saying if you meet someone for the first time, you want to cooperate, you don't know whether this person is going to cooperate, and then this is like an urn that is ambiguous to you, right? And then the more samples you see, then uh, you you become this becomes a risk, and then you can deal with this in the same kind of fashion. Right. Um, so we're using. So I was saying that you can use this now for risk sensitive decision making or ambiguity um, sensitive decision making, where you have model misspecification. We also use it now um, when we read this as you want to maximize expected utility with a constraint on how much information you can process. So that would be a con like a bounded rationality uh, way to read the same kind of formula, but that's not um, relevant to the talk today, I guess. Um, yeah, ultimately maybe just two remarks. What are alternative models of risk? So usually in the economic sciences, you model risk um, just by the curvature of the utility function, right? So if you have a marginally decreasing um, curvature here, that implies that you're risk averse. And so very often the problem in the behavioral sciences is to know, okay, maybe is there some other nonlinear way I can express my utilities, right? Um, such that I can explain the behavior with expected utility, but with a strange nonlinear function. And there's like a whole research field that has looked at under what conditions um, do I get mean variance trade off with such expected utility decision makers and like quadratic utility functions, Gaussian noise, and so on. But in general, um, these two things are not the same. And especially these variational preferences, as I said, they can model this ambiguity aversion, which you cannot do with expected utility models, right? And otherwise, you can always argue that it's convenient to have this kind of model. Um, another class of models that's quite prominent in the behavioral science is prospect theory to model risk. Um, so there you don't have um, a single parameter, but like a fourfold pattern of risk that looks at uh, gains, losses, and distortions of probabilities. Um, the problem with this is that this is not normative and therefore it's not really interesting, I think, if you if you want to think about how to implement it in robotics. Right, so that brings me to the end. So we, sh we showed that humans show deviations from risk neutral behavior that often you can express it as a mean variance trade off. Um, and that these risk sensitive optimal control models capture behavior um, quite well, also when you have model misspecification. Um, one issue is when you extract these parameters for how risk sensitive or um, ambiguity sensitive people are, how does that uh, generalize across different tasks? And usually the generalization is quite poor. Um, that's also what other people have found. Um, yeah, maybe I stop here. So thanks for listening um, and thanks for the people that have worked with me. Hi. Um, so I'm curious, um, were you able to control in any way for uh, the subject's ability to accurately estimate risk? Like, were you able to differentiate between subjects that were uh, risk averse because they accurately estimated the risk and were averse to it versus subjects who just 
did not accurately estimate that. Right. So the problem always is when you do this kind of motor control tasks that a lot of the stuff or most of it is implicit, right? So subjects cannot really report about what they believe the risk is. So, so what you do is you, you train, so you, do, you have to look at behavior. So you train them, for example, um, to, to do a certain, uh, like to hit a particular target, right? And you adjust this target size such that they hit it exactly 50% of the time. And then you make sure that this remains stable, right? So they remain, they get it to a stable point. Um, and then you know that, um, that, that they can do this, but you're asking whether they are maybe consciously aware that that's 50%, right? Yeah, and that is hard to establish. I mean, even if we ask them, well, we, if you would ask them, do you hit it 50 percent? You believe you hit it 50 percent of the time? Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, so so we don't really look at that. We just look at the behavior, right? I mean, even the economists look at the behavior and try to infer from the behavior whether they behave as if they are risk sensitive or not. I guess. All right, we'll take one or two more questions and go to coffee break. Uh, anything from the audience? Nothing. Uh, I guess. Um, uh, is there any questions? Okay. Yeah. I think I have a question. It wasn't very clear for me how you explained what is an ambiguity. Uh, Uncertainty and uh, well, uncertainty in the cost itself and ambiguity. I don't think that I like to know more. Sorry, what's the a question? I couldn't hear it. Uh, yeah, the question was whether or not you could speak a bit more to the distinction between uh, ambiguity and uncertainty. Right. So, um, yeah, so, so the terms are um, not always used strictly in the same way. Uh, ambiguity usually means that you have a situation where you don't have any information. For sure, that would be ambiguous, right? Like in this Ellsberg case. Um, uncertainty is often used as a cover term, like for everything. You say there's uncertainty and then there's risk, where risk means uh, basically uncertainty that you know, like throwing a dice or something like that. Um, whereas ambiguity means that you know nothing, but then there's the stuff in between, which is also degrees of ambiguity, right? When, you, when I just show you a few samples of a distribution, you know something about this distribution, but not so much. So that would be a degree of, of ambiguity. And yeah, so sometimes ambiguity is also called Unknown uncertainty and, and known uncertainty would be risk. And so uncertainty would be a cover term. All right, thank you. Uh, so we're going to go to a, a coffee break. We're going to gather back here in about 10 minutes. Um, so uh, oh, no, we, ha we have about 20, 25 minutes. So we should be back here at 11. And the coffee break is on the 40th.